Chad Stahelski, how are you, mate? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for doing this. You have become a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the realm of action. So I'm going to be picking your brains about all sorts of things. There's so much to choose from, so much to talk about. So we'll get right into it. Um, Chad, can you tell everyone briefly, because I know it's a long list, I'm sure, but what is uh, briefly your, your martial arts background? How did you get into it? What was your first martial art? How old were you when you started? Um, I'm from Palmer, Massachusetts, a very small town on the East Coast of the United States, uh, right above Hartford, Connecticut, where you can imagine there's not a lot of martial arts schools, especially back in the early 70s. Um, my dad was on the fire department, and he there's another... I kept talking to my dad about... We'd watch uh, Bruce Lee movies on Sunday mornings or whatever, you know? Yeah. I said, I want to do martial arts. I want to do martial arts. I don't want to do baseball. Or football. I like, I want to punch and kick. And I think I was only 10 at the time. And he's like, all right. And he had a friend on the fire department, a guy named Lee McDonald that was a judo instructor. And, you know, my dad trying to, you know, find something for me. So I don't think he knew the difference between karate or punching and kicking and judo. And so I got stuck in judo for the next four or five years, which was great, which was, you know, obviously all the throwing. And How old were you at this point? I thought, I was about 10, 10, 11 when I started. Oh, yeah. So, so same as me, started judo when I was 10? Yeah, so I, I think I was in that class all the way through high school to a senior in high school, so five, six years. You know, And it was a bit of a mix. It had it was Olympic judo mixed a little bit with some Japanese jiu-jitsu, but it had a lot of uh, – and it was, it had a lot of uh, grappling as well. You know, he was a fairly – I would say it was a 60-40 class, 60% of the throwing, but 40% spent a lot of time on grappling. Um, so I guess that's even today. I still, obviously you can tell by the choreography we do that I'm still a big judo fan. Oh yeah. Um, and obviously I, I still teach and coach and train. I have a Marcelo Garcia shirt, but I still train as much Brazilian and Japanese Jiu Jitsu as I can throughout the week. You know, we have our facility where I have both teach and have several Jiu Jitsu coaches that I still work with every day. Um, yeah. I guess from there I studied, uh, when I was 15, I got into karate as well as I was doing judo which was called Kokondo, which is the uh, closest thing I guess most people would know would be Kyokushinkai, very close to Kyokushinkai, the katas, the self-defense, uh, two-man sets and stuff, and the way they would spar or, or train for competition would be very, very similar. And then uh, I went to college at USC in California, in Los Angeles, and I met up with one of Dan Asano's instructors, a guy named Bert Richardson, that I trained with for a year uh, as I was a freshman in college, then got right into the Asano Academy, which if anybody, knows is huge filipino malaysian indonesian martial arts where they specialize it was almost like a college you'd go for kali and jiu-jitsu and penchak silat and thai kickboxing i met salim asli and franisi sanchinari which were like two of the biggest savat guys so i trained and competed in savat that's where we met yuri naganakamura you know the guy that brought shoot wrestling or shudo to the united states so i got to compete with a guy named Eric Polson, and you know, one day we're fighting Muay Thai or competing in Muay Thai, the next day we're doing Savat, the next day we're doing shoot wrestling, then we're in a judo competition, then we're in a kickboxing combat, WKA kickboxing competition. Um, so you're cross training before people were really into cross training, just the way he would train us. I mean, you know, you'd stay for an hour and a half class of, of uh, you know, Kali and Sila, they would call it, a mix between Filipino, Malaysian, Indonesian martial arts. And then you'd go right into a two hour kickboxing class. And then you'd go into a boxing class. And then Ted Lukailakai or, or you know, Lucky Lukailakai or Edgar Saludi when he was still alive, or, you know, or the different Filipino Kali or Screma masters or instructors would come when we do that. Then we'd have Paul de Trois or, um, you know, some of the other Hari Mao or, or Jamundi kind of see all these wacky styles of, of Indonesian sea lot would come in and then it'd be a sea lot class. And then, you know, you know, Higgin or Hicks and Gracie would come in and we'd be exposed to that. So it was like a wacky right. time, you know, it's still analog. So there's still no internet yet. We weren't, yeah. it wasn't YouTube. It was like, if you weren't learning from the guy or going to the Go gym and, it. and at the same time, we had our friends that later we'd go into stunts with, you know, like, um, Tim Connolly, Clay Barber, JJ Perry, all these great, you know, Taekwondo guys that were just literally down the street. So, you know, on the off days, if we weren't kickboxing, we're learning how to kick paddles with these guys or rolling around with some of the Jiu Jitsu guys. You know, it's still stunts and choreography really hadn't hit yet. Martial art movies were still, I guess, lower budget, 
you know, they weren't the big budget shows. They hadn't made their way into mainstream. You know, it was all chop sake movies or it was big action movies like Schwarzenegger, you know? Well, how did you get into the movies then? Uh, it's funny, a lot of stuntmen, not a lot, but there's a couple of fairly well-known stuntmen at the time uh, and a stunt coordinator named Jeff Amata that was training at the Innocent yeah. Academy that was actually an instructor there. And, you know, like, I, again, I'm from the East Coast. I didn't know you could make a career, <laughs> let alone have a job in movies as a stunt guy. I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. I'll be a businessman or something like that. I was going to school for business. And, you know, through conversations with Jeff, who's much older, much more experienced, was like, yeah, we work in movies and this is what you do. And like, okay, what does a stunt guy do? And this is what he does. And, you know, at the time, in order to be a stunt guy, it was more about driving or being a cowboy or being a high fall guy or a gymnast. Fights really hadn't, funny enough, other than barroom brawls, fights, which today are what people think about the most when they think of stunts. Back then, it was a very, very small part of mainstream stunt work. So when he, you know, invited me to, to kind of partake in or at least be exposed to the world, it was 90% all these other skills, how to, how to rig and tie knots, how to do a lot of deep diving scuba stuff, how to do what they call air ramps or trampoline or how to set up the wire rigs that we do nowadays or a lot of driving and motorcycles. And I had some background in some of those things so that at least got me into the business. Is this one of your first experience of stunt work, of, of fighting on film? Yeah, oh my God, who's that guy? Uh, it's me and Daniel Barnhart, oh my God. Yeah, that is my real hair too, believe it or not. Uh, thank you for embarrassing me, that's really- I weird. don't think it's embarrassing, I think it's cool, man. Well, Dan, I was talking to Daniel the other day, he was saying, well, this was the best fight of Bloodsport too, because you choreographed it. Uh, that's very nice of him to say, Yeah. Uh, obviously. You can see um, the uh, Jeet Kune Do, you know, Dana Santo influence with the, the, the trapping. Then. You got to remember, choreography is like fashion, too. It's kind of what's hip and now. That we hadn't quite figured out all the camera angles. We hadn't quite figured out choreography is more like dance and martial arts. So, you know, if you want a capoeira fight scene, you'd hire a guy that was actually good at capoeira. If you wanted a trapping fight scene, you'd hire a guy that was good at Jun Fon or Wing Chun. If you wanted, you know, a gymnastic-y kind of fight, you'd hire the the gymnast guy, or if you wanted, you know, jujitsu, you'd hire the jujitsu guy. So you kind of did it like that. Nowadays, we know we can choreograph anything and teach our cast that and kind of, choreography is a little different nowadays. But yeah, uh, this is one of the first times myself and some of the guys actually did choreography on screen. I think I was only like 23 here or whatever. Over in well, had anyone ever taught you at this point, oh, this is how you sell a punch for a camera or was it just obvious for you? No. It was, there was a few of us at the Inasano Academy that, it's funny enough, we had met, Brandon Lee started training over there, and this is when Brandon was still trying to get his career off the ground as well. So, like, on weekends, on Saturday afternoons or Sundays, we'd all get together and try to figure out movie punches and watch old Jackie Chan movies on VHS and try to frame by frame and go, oh, we'll just try this. I mean, our understanding was like, yeah, try not to kill the guy. <laughs> You know, yeah. just um, try not to hit his ribs. And because the, there's times in that Bloodsport fight and Bloodsport three where I can see that you've got the camera awareness. You know what I mean? You're yeah. you're opening up to camera to throw the punch, which is the mistake that most green people make, I right? For my 22nd birthday, my great grandmother, uh, in a in a big act of generosity, bought me a VHS video camera. The thing was like this this big, like a big yeah. suitcase looking thing. Um, we put the actual whole VHS tape in it. And I got there and I brought out, and I think I was only a freshman in college then. Yeah, I was probably a freshman. Um, and me and like two or three other guys from the academy would get together on Sundays with Brandon and one or two of his friends, and we just hold the camera and go, oh, we can't see anything, step to the left. Zero schooling, just all trial and error. <laughs> At least for the. You're just messing time. about with Brandon Lee, trying to figure out how to make kung fu movies with yeah, the, the son of Bruce Lee. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. So that was a pretty cool start to it. But like, you know, even before we met Brandon, we were already kind of messing around. I had friends like this guy, uh, who's a, still a really good stunt guy choreographer and Damon Carr, Rich Citrone and Damon Carl were two other instructors in the academy. They're now doing their own thing and they're, they're doing really well in, in stunt work and choreography. And I think Damon's even doing a bunch of second unit now too for yeah, some yeah. of the, the DC universe. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We had a good education. We had Dan and Asana, which is an incredible thinker and coach. We mm -hmm. exposed to some pretty decent sun guys from Jeff Amata on that were just yeah. really breaching the gap 
from smaller budget to bigger budget martial art choreography stuff. Yeah. Jeff Imada was doing the Bourne films, right? Yeah. Is that right? Like, yeah. He had started doing some of the Bourne. And then we had started building up our own, like, the academy worked on like team structure. You, you try to become a good member of the, the kickbox team or the college team or the demo team. And then you got to instruct and then you built up your guy. So we had a pretty good structure system with more than eager and talented guys in different disciplines that wanted to be in the movie thing. Like today we still use John Eusebio, he's John Valero. There's still, I think I have three, three or four guys that actually came through the academy system that have mm -hmm. a real martial art basis that transferred into movie stuff. You gotta remember choreography is a lot more like dance than actual fighting. So even professional fighters have to go through, I mean, the best example I can make is if you look at a professional ballerina, whether it's a lead ballerina or one of the chorus line, they go through an hour and 45 minute performance and don't make a mistake with over a thousand moves. That's the minimal we expect from our team now is like, you can't just be a good kicker puncher. You gotta be able to go three minutes memorizing 300 moves. That's how you get on our team. Like you yeah. need memory, you need the precision, you need repeatability, and you need to be smart enough, good enough not to get hurt or hurt anybody else. That's where you become of value to us. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But yeah, yeah. Well, do you mind just talking about Brandon Lee briefly? Because I think he would have been as big as Keanu Reeves. I mean, he was, he was already getting there, wasn't he? By the time yeah, he timely died. Again, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, one day, you know, Dennis, uh, well, there's different levels of classes, like the, the advanced level classes. Dennis on uh, a one day goes, hey guys, just wanna let you know, a good family friend of mine is gonna start class. He's pretty good. He's been away for a while, he's come back. Just, you know, understand that like, and he said who it was, it's Brandon Lee. He's like, look, he's not Bruce. Like he's not coming here to kick ass and fight. Like, you know, he's this guy. And, and we're all like, okay, cool. What do you expect from, you know, remember this is before the end before anybody knew anything. Brandon shows up the next night and he, nothing like you would expect the most open. He was just a very happy guy. Um, yeah. He was there because he actually wanted to learn martial arts. He wasn't trying to do, it's not like the actor thing or he's just trying to get the, the street creds of being in the Academy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. He actually gave a shit. He loved martial arts. He wanted to come in and not do just square feet, but he wanted to practice high boxing. He wanted to spar. He wanted to get on. And he had already done a considerable amount of training with other people before he'd come in, including Dan. Um, honestly, I, I think he was one of the happier people there. I, I was a real curmudgeon, but like, I was like, who's this guy? And so I sure. that. And Brandon was just like the happiest guy. Like, hey guys, what are we doing? And like, let's work out. He was always gung ho and happy and fun and just loved being an actor, loved being an athlete. And he was very talented. I mean, he picked up very quick. You know, six months later, he's just one of the guys, you know, in the advanced class in the gym doing his thing. I mean, he was always a, you know, fun guy. But to that note, like, you know, he was trying to do his thing. We're trying to, we're trying to get started as stuntman. He's trying to get work as an actor. I think he'd done some of the smaller stuff. Um, do you work on any, any of his films? Not The Crow, because I know you did The Crow, but before that. No, but that, that's actually the thing. You know, he was kind of on his path. And even though we'd see each other during the week and we'd train together on weekends, there's small click as we'd get together. And he'd say like, hey, I'm doing um, in this movie. I, I want to practice some. And he would use us to practice that. We just weren't in that realm yet or very established as stuntmen. We were even below the level to even work on one of his beginning shows. It's just, you know, we weren't there yet. We were just so fresh. So this is like, we didn't really work on any of his shows. You know, he was just, he was a little ahead of us progressing up the ranks and we couldn't even get a job as a, you know, as a guy walking across the street as the background at the time. But we did train together. We did, you know, uh, practice a lot together. And then, you know, the, obviously the crow came up. Um, I wasn't on that. It wasn't until after, you know, the accident that Jeff Amato, who was a sun quarter, said, hey, you know, you're aware of what happened. It's a tragedy, but uh, the powers that be have decided we're gonna move forward with the project. Um, would you be interested in not only doing some of the stunts, but would you, you know, because of our body type, we, we look very similar. Would yeah. you be the, you know, whatever you wanna call it, the photo double or the acting double, the, the, the standing double for it? Is this you, Chad, or is uh, it someone else? I will neither confirm nor deny, but uh, this right. was during some of the reshoots. Oh, okay. Uh, we just had very similar body types, and yeah. uh, Brandon had gone through the process of, Brandon was about my size, maybe like a half inch shorter, but to get ready for the crow, he literally dropped down to like, I think 155 pounds from 175 to really yeah. lean up and go that kind of stuff. So 
Uh, he well, put you're pretty lean anyway, aren't you? And you were lean in that blood sport clip. Yeah. And then, you know, just the work he had put in was, you know, I, again, I wasn't there for the accident. I wasn't there, you know, when they made the decision to continue. It had been months after the accident where they had called and yeah. asked if I'd be interested. And I went and met with Alex Pro as the director. And it was literally like a, a week in this small studio basement with the director watching uh, all the behind the scenes footage and the rehearsals of Brandon and watching the actual, what they call dailies, the footage of the film. And Alex was, I mean, I hadn't done any acting even close to that, whether it's physical or with the lines, not, not to that level or, or double work for that matter. I'd only been in just the very beginning stunt guy. So Alex Proas, the director, spent a lot of time with me walking and trying to mimic uh, Brandon, you know, a couple hours a day. And what you see is a resulting film, obviously, you know, we're all, yeah saddened by the accent we're all very proud of the work that we put into it well we, we all wanted to see what he'd done i mean he did such an amazing job with the crow you know it needed to be finished so we could all enjoy the work that he put into it so you know it needed to be done but obviously it was a terrible thing that happened i remember it vividly because it was uh, april fool's day and i was at school and everyone said oh brandon lee's died i thought that was, you know it was an april fool's joke it's, yeah, it was pretty... terrible it was very yeah. sucked Um, I had just done a car hit and that's when, you know, I was doubling a, a, a cast member on a TV show. You get hit by a car, you get spun off. And I think I had hit my head a couple times after three takes. I was in torn up jeans and a bleeding, bleeding from my head. <laughs> and I had gotten this call to go to the audition in Burbank. I think I was in downtown and it was to double or potentially double or audition to double Keanu Reeves for a sci-fi action movie. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I, I kind of landed on my head on that last one. I don't know if I'm going to make this audition. And my boss at the time was like, no, no, you should go. You should go, you know. You know, Keanu has this, you know, big action. You should go. Maybe, you know, you look like it. You should go try it out. I had no idea what it was. So I drive all the way to Burbank. I think I'm still bleeding when I show up. And then in the corner of the room, I, I go through. I meet the producer. I meet the two directors at the time, the Wachowskis. And, um you know, there's all this stuff going on in the background. It's a big workout area with like a dozen, you know, the Hong Kong Chinese stunt team and Keanu Reeves. And I was like, oh, well, this looks a little different. I see they're doing some Kung Fu forms. I'm like, oh, this doesn't look like a sci-fi movie. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What you want. And they kind of take one look at me and I take one look at Leigh and we both thinking like, who are these guys? They're Is looking training at with Young Wu Ping at this point or not? And well, that's the thing. Then I got introduced and no one had told me anything about this. I didn't know anything other than just I was showing up. So I'm in jeans and a white t-shirt with some of my own blood on it, still trying to stop the bleeding. And they're like, oh, by the way, this is Yung Wu Ping. And having, you know, been an adamant, you know, just a, 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 a huge Hong Kong and Chinese Kung Fu fan, knew exactly who that was. And there's three or four guys on the stunt team that trust me, if you're anything into Kung Fu movies, you'd recognize, you mm. know, things other brothers like, Chen Yi and all this, you'd be like, you know, Chen Yan, you're like, I know every one of these faces. And I'm like, something's clicking in my head going, what did I just get myself into? What am I doing? I thought I was just coming. And they're like, oh, okay, good, warm up. I'm like, I'm going to pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt. And okay, I guess I'll take off my shoes and warm up. The audition lasted about an hour. And I think I threw every flip, every stretch, every kick, every piece of choreography, I knew what I was doing. And then I had to jump in and learn their choreography and do their Kung Fu. Hardcore was it? Hardcore. It was most auditions. Like, from the head three, from the four, night yeah, three or four minute audition. And it, that's the most you got. You know, you showed off a couple of okay, done. This is an hour long of try everything, try everything. And I'm like, okay, thank you. And I was like, okay, woo, okay. Drew, drove back home. A couple of weeks later, one of the producers gives me a call and says, hey, you know, okay, you know, uh, you did good. Can you come back in? And I swear to God, I went back. Absolutely would love to go back in. Did the exact same audition again. Like, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Every flip, every kick, almost in the exact same order. And then they just say, okay, thank you. The That's same the people or more people? Oh, same, same people, people same everything. Else. <laughs> okay. I guess just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Yeah. And I get a call a couple weeks later going, okay, well, hey, you know, we'd like you to go to Australia and do this movie. And, you know, I'd already committed to a TV show. So I actually turned down the makeup. I said, I can't go. I'm going to double this guy on TV till February. And they're like, okay. And hang up 
never hear from anybody. Cut to two months later, it's now February. Unbeknownst to us, Keanu had had a neck injury where he had a little surgery, so they had to push all the action in the movie to the later part of. Yeah, it was funny to watch him do the Kung Fu forms with the neck brace on. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but you've seen the behind the scenes footage. So they called back again. I guess they still hadn't gotten a martial art double form by that point, and they said, hey, would you be willing to go? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'm available, let's go. And still, even at that point, again, you don't know what it is. And it was a couple of Kung Fu moves. So I get to Australia, I go to the sound stage, Fox stages on, I mean, the Fox lot on uh, in Sydney, Australia. First day I get out of the van, I go warm up, I go into the training hall and it's the same deal. There's wire rigs up where there's all this stuff. And at the time we're rehearsing the government lobby fight, which is, you know, I got to do a cartwheel over at the time it was a pistol, pick it up, shoot a bunch of people, triple kick in the wire, come back down. And it was literally, uh, you know, 50 reps on everything just get it right get it right had you done much wire work before that no none really i mean we had played i mean ratchets what you consider like yes yeah, but not like kung fu yeah, China not like kung fu, no never and that's what it takes a little bit to get i had a, a fairly decent trampoline and gymnastic background that definitely helped i had a good my flexibility was very good my strength was pretty good so that definitely helped but it was definitely trial by fire <laughs> you could say yeah um and they were, you know, it was Yung Ping's big breakout into Hollywood. They really cared. It was a big deal. The Wachowskis are obviously perfectionists. So the first two, three weeks of training was like, it, it, it made it very clear what we were in. And it wasn't until that point you realized, wow, you're on something special. But we all kind of knew it, even back in the training. You got a bit busted up on that, didn't you? Uh, just on the last... Uh, it's second to last stunt, I think it was during this fight. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, all the, all the ratchets are cool. I mean, the stunt team, everybody was great. You know, it, it looks a lot worse than it is. When he does the, uh, the hit up into the, uh, the ceiling with uh, uh, another stuntman named Paul on my back. We all went up, and then on the way back down, it was about, I think, 28 feet or whatever, uh, the cable system had a small glitch in it. When we came back down, we didn't stop. <laughs> So uh, right. most of my right leg got a little messed up, I would say. I got a little shorter for a little while. Busted my knee, my hip, my ankle, a uh, few other little things in there. So I was limping for a while. But I uh, came back strong. It took a couple months, yeah. but all good. You don't want to be messing with your knees too much, do you, if you're doing martial arts? Um, yeah, no, it was a really shitty injury. Uh, you know, I thought, I'm done. You know, the knee was, my knee had turned around, the kneecap had dislocated, I had torn two or three of my ligaments, I needed surgery, uh, couldn't fly back from Australia to do it back here, so I had to sit to the swelling until I could actually move my leg a little bit to get on the plane. But the good thing is, the Wachowskis, you know, they felt bad, and, you know, they had set up a lot of their post house, so they are editing as they went on the, in the Fox Studios in Sydney, and like, well, since you're a little busted up, would you like to come into editing? And again, remember, at the time, it's still a lot of analog, we, you know, they're just starting to get into offline editing digital editing so i got to sit in the edit room and, and work on the avid a little bit and like still only being 25 years old and still somewhat new i got to sit in with zach the the editor who later won the oscar for the movie um and that got me i got really interested like i thought this as well this is something i want to get into so literally every penny and that's I made, the most it, fun i would say that the, yeah. the most fun part of filmmaking is the editing process oh, the editing. I mean, and you know any good director is good in editing and any you know it, you have to be a choreographer you don't understand editing you're not going to be able to put or create the character or the characterization of the movements that you want so i literally took every penny i made on the matrix went home and bought like i think you know mac 2 ci at the time it had like half a gig of memory on it um and the original 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 Adobe Premiere 1.0, which yeah. you could get like 15 seconds of video on before it crashed, and just started learning to edit. So you didn't need your big VHS camcorder anymore. It was literally running off that. Actually, I still use it <laughs> the, the the output. Yeah. Um, but that's so. Like I would say, since the inception of, you know, what everyone would consider the offline editing now, like I, I would like to think I was in the first wave of people that kind of got into it at the home at the home level. How important is, is, is it to understand editing? Because I get quite frustrated when I'm on a film set and I know that they're just filming all the fight from various different angles and I know so much of my hard work is going to end up on the cutting room floor. If you don't mind, I'll attack your question from the other side of things, which is, Go on. this is my famous rant or my infamous rant. Like, look, 
this goes out to everybody. And I know, like, look, I know exactly I'm not the greatest. I'm not anything like that. I have so much more to learn. I still try things. But my perspective on things, if you want to be a director, and I've worked as a second unit guy with some of the best directors on the planet, and I've had these conversations, and I've been very fortunate. The first unit directors I was working for as an action director were exceptional. Uh, I've had that great career as a, as a second unit action guy where I would say 75% of the other directors or movies I've worked on were incredibly good directors, incredibly good, you know? Um, and then we all have the other ones, but like out of those directors, directing is directing. If it's in front of that camera and if it requires anything behind that camera to set up for what's in front of it, that is directing. So we get so many times you get, either the studio, the producer thing, or the director going, I don't do action. The second unit guy will do it. Okay, like I get that, thank God, I bought a house based on that, that's helped my career. <laughs> but like, then what are you doing directing? If half the movie is action, and you don't do action, or you don't say, like every director out there likes to talk about story. And I get, we're, like, when you go into, from second unit to first unit directing, they're gonna go, look, we know you can do the action, but can you direct actors? And I'm, you know, obviously we're egotistical, so we want to go, yes, I can do action. And I want to ask the other guys, I know you can film a guy walking and talking, but can you do 45 minutes of interesting action that will be in every trailer and sell your movie? The answer most of the time is no. If you want to be a director, you want to be an action director, you want to be a regular director, action is blocking, action is filming, action is editing, action is angles, action is storytelling. It is no fucking different than doing a scene talking. It is no different. If you're going to put all that time into getting the story and doing read throughs and spending two weeks working your actors in the room, you know, you're doing 12 angry men and it's just in a room and you got to get everyone's performance. You want it. Okay. That's action. If you put that much time into the acting part, why wouldn't you put that much time into something that's okay. Could be dangerous one, but two is really going to sell your movie. If half your movie, if you're doing an action film, and you don't study action, why did you take that job? Or even more, why did they hire you? Why are you not, like, it's not that hard. I didn't know how to do it. Just because I was a stunt guy doesn't make, doesn't mean, shh, doesn't mean anything. Like, it doesn't mean you can operate a camera. It doesn't mean you know how to edit. It doesn't mean you know how to choreograph. It doesn't, it doesn't mean any of that. I'm, I'm starting from the same ground level as, say, a writer that wants to be a director that has no physical attributes behind just an average human. We both have, I had to go and, dissect every Jackie Chan, Zatoichi, you know, Kurosawa, Spielberg, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, Peck and Paw to, to anybody else's work. You dissect it. You learn how to edit. You go back and you shoot like it's trial and error. Like it's practice. Yeah. If I have to rehearse how to do, okay, I got to get Scott. I got to get a chin. I got to sit you down. This is where you're going to sit. This is where you're going to smoke the cigarette. This is where you're going to do these lines right here and go. Okay. That's blocking and how I flow the camera. You know, watch a Fincher film, watch a Spielberg film. The camera talks and how we block it. Okay, there's no difference of you walking than it is you kicking or punching. You still have to create a flow. You still have to tell a story. You still have to do that. And it's not rocket science. You, you, you try to get the angles that show off and tell the story you want to do. Like, so much now, it's because they don't want to spend time in prep or not everybody's Scott Atkins or Bruce Lee or something like that. So you, you get cast members and action editing and action filming now is more about either the director doesn't know what he's doing. So you're going to shoot it from everywhere. And because you didn't practice or rehearse, there's no energy or it's not good enough to see wide. So you try to shake the camera around to infuse energy that wasn't in the choreography to begin with, yeah. or you're trying to hide. Maybe we'll get lucky. Yes. Or you're trying to hide something because your cast member didn't have the training. And we'll talk about that in a sec. You're trying to hide the fact that they can't touch your toes. And you get that in superhero movies or when you know you have a really high level cast member who's supposed to do either a comedy act do the splits or something like that i know nowadays we can do face replacements and we do really good things with doubles and digital work but you have to hide the fact that you're not good at it and that's become the excuse for not putting time into action and that's like look you don't need 15 weeks of training you need smart people to do things like if i have a cast member and that's like a whole 87 11 thing like look it's my job. You're the director. You're coming to me as a choreographer going, look, we've got this cast member. We love him. He's great. He's got two bad hips. He's had a hip replacement. Great actor. Just can't touch his toes. He's got a bad shoulder and he can't turn his head to the left. All right. So do you think I'm going to choreograph Taekwondo for this guy? 
It could be doubled every single month. Like that's a fail that the probability of success is zero. But if I teach him how to do a pressure point thing with a, uh, you know, an ice pick and he's going to do close quarter gun work, my probability of success is I probably won't need as much of a double. If any, I'm going to do something really cool. I'm going to be creative and I'm going to film in a way that you're going to know this is the guy that's doing it. You just yeah. have to be You're going to play to the strengths of the performer. Exactly. You have to be creative in the obstacles presented to you. We were sitting on the set of Speed Racer. We're shooting in Babelsberg in Germany, outside of Berlin. Um, and uh, Dave, Dave Leach was over there. I was over there. Some of our guys were over there. And, you know, we just want to work with the Wachowskis again. It was a big, uh, whether you like Speed Racer or not, the, uh, the techniques and the technology behind Speed Racer was pretty epic. And we want to be a part of it. And on that movie, uh, you know, who you see in Ninja Assassin, Rain or B-Rain, was uh, you know a Korean you know pop star with a, you know a lot of notoriety in, in the Asian market. Um, the Wachowskis loved him and cast him as a as a character in Speed Racer. And he had one little piece in a fight scene. Um, we're like okay, cool. Um, you know during filming, you know uh, Rain had come into town and I was in charge of training him and kind of choreographing for him. I literally finished a workout with him and went right to the Wachowskis and went, hey, you guys got to check this guy out. Like he's He's a real deal. Like he's a dancer, memory. He's a good looking dude. He's got talent, such a nice guy, remembers moves, got attitude, super lot of talent. And like, and he comes from a martial art background and they didn't know any of that. He did and come from a martial arts background then. He had, I mean, he never said he did. He's like, no, I only maybe take a couple, you know, a couple less. He had a serious Taekwondo, Hapkido fight base to him. Like he was a good good when i say i mean that's me saying he's a good kicker and he was a good good movement guy like the ability like you could tell he had come from a, a legitimate professional dance background he picked up moves faster than literally anyone i've worked with so far yeah well and, that's it's just choreography isn't it yeah exactly so we went back to the Wachowskis, and they're like really and they came and they watched and we started talking he's like and they asked dave and i well what would you always do is like ah oh, let's do a ninja movie and they're like great and they went and literally wrote ninja assassin you know, ask James, you know, who's, a, you know, one of their, I, I think, closest friends, if he'd like to direct. And if we'd like to choreograph it and just kind of go crazy and do a, you know, a lower budget ninja movie in Berlin. Well, like, ah, of course, who doesn't want to do a ninja movie? That sequence there is amazing. Incredible stuff. Yeah, uh, that's all practical blood. We actually took, we did the Conan. Yeah. We put, you know, these big blood bags, we velcroed them on the stunt guys, and we actually hit them with aluminum swords to get that splatter. And then we digitally erased them before they hit Sure. I have no idea. That's that's crazy. Oh, I was really? looking at some of that, thinking, hey, John, John Wick is I almost." Tell that's a visual effect. <laughs> yeah. John Wick, it's almost all digital blood. In Ninja Assassin, it is ninety-eight percent practical blood. Oh, that must have been a bitch to reset, but at least everyone's wearing black. I think what helped you immensely was, of course, 8711 was known for creating pre visits of action and giving it to studio and said, look, this is what we can create for you. Obviously, making those pre visits in the gym, on the camcorders, I mean, that's yeah. filmmaking. And so obviously, you're doing a lot of that. Do you think that helped you become the director you are today? I think it's definitely an aspect of it. Like, you know, like, look, uh, we can go off on pre visits all day. We started doing them for practice because it's the only way we know how to do it. And it was out of necessity because we came at it from that, okay, because I had so much time with the, with, the, with the Chinese teams and knew how they did it. Their level of prep blew ours away. It was mm. a cast member, train, like, look, a lot of stunt, here's the thing with a lot of stunt, a lot of stunt teams will hire 10 choreographers for 10 weeks and then they'll train the actor for two weeks. How do you think that's going to work out? You can do the greatest choreography, you can come up with the greatest ideas all you want. You can have your stunt doubles all you want. At the end of the day, when you're bitching about, you can know how to edit. Like these stunt teams know how to edit. They know how to shoot. But what's the, the systemic problem? If well, you spend a yeah. million dollars on this actor and you want the actor to be it, they're going to cut. They're going to put his face in there. They're going to do it. If you don't anticipate that and 
choreograph your entire fight to be this kung fu wushu extravaganza wire work thing and your actor does three shots in it how do you think it's going to work out but also Our, in hong kong they're tough on the actors they don't care it's that, like, do the it, actors do are either again. their actors are trained they're either the deal it like look we'll go i'll use the first john wick as an example Keanu had come from like two years of doing stuff that didn't require a lot of physicality. He wasn't in John Wick shape. He didn't have any of the martial art training that he had in that film. We had, you know, we went to him and go, look, this is the deal. We don't have time. We're, it wasn't just we wanted to show no editing. We just didn't have time. We didn't have a second unit. We were going to shoot first unit, all the action. We were going to get these big long takes done because you know, they were cheaper. We didn't have time for all the setups and relight. So we told Keanu, we're going to get you in shape. We don't want to risk punching and kicking because it's going to take you a year to get your splits back. We're going to do all grappling, jujitsu grappling. So no matter what angle we're at, it's going to be a sell. We don't have to sell hits. We don't have to worry about a miss. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We're going to train in close quarter gun work so we can keep the camera wide and still see everything. We're going to block it so that we tie all the bad guys in. And we're going to roll, whether you, whether the gun jams, whether you have to reload, we're just going to see it all on camera and everything's going to be contact. And that's kind of how we, we worked it out. But the caveat was we need you to commit to train with us for the 15 weeks, for the three months. You got to he, He'd already gone through the matrix. So he knew what was expected of him, what and he needed he, to do. I mean, he's, he's like five days a week. I'm in. Yeah. And that's what you need. So it's not so much about, spending 15 weeks of queer, queer, you know, choreographing. It's 15 weeks of getting our actor so that he can have the memory, so that he can have the skill set. All the guys you're seeing in the sequence are the guys that trained with him for 15 weeks. They know everything about like he's used to them. They don't like, it's not training with one group of guys and hiring another group of guys in a different country. Like it's just, we took the dance routine just like a professional dance crew or a dance uh, troupe would do it. They train together, they live together, they work together, they rehearse together every single day so that they're working, you know, he's training in the shoes, in the jacket, with the holster, with the real gun, like. Oh, really? He's training in the jacket, in the suit? Yeah, like you get all these guys that will stay in rehearse and they'll choreograph in shorts and tank tops. And then yeah. all of a sudden your entire cast the self -included. is in here. And you're wondering why the actor can't move because he's got a, you know, a tactical vest on and the gun is actually holstered and, you know, it's not rubber or made out of cardboard. Like if you're not, if you're not doing dress rehearsals and the real stuff with the real props, you're not rehearsing. Like, you know, we have that big joke. The only real rehearsal is the first take. But well, this that, sums it up. This bit here, all the legitimate techniques and the struggle and the fact that it's just a simple angle and it's absolutely brilliant and very violent. Uh, again, I have a certain choreography theory. I try to treat everything like a live performance. I try to keep your eye centered. I try to keep it Based like if you saw John Wick, the Broadway show, and you're sitting in the middle seat, what would you see? And this is what you would see. You know, the camera is meant to focus your eye, but the performance is really the guys or the girls. It's the, the stunt team and the cast members. I need to own up to something. Uh, so I managed to see some previous stuff from 8 to 7 11 uh, back in the day. I guess it was around 2010. And it was basically what we're now calling gun jitsu or gun fu. Was it gun fu or gun jitsu? It seems like gun jitsu to me. Whatever you like. But anyway, I was like, man, I cannot unsee that now. Now that I've seen that, I cannot unsee it. It was absolutely brilliant because we didn't get um, John Wick for quite a few years after that. So I blatantly ripped you guys off when I did Al Gringo, tiny little movie. And I'm basically doing the John Wick style because it's like when you see that, you, can, you can't unsee it. You have to do gunfights that way. You, you changed the way people did gunfights. When John Woo came along, he, that changed it. Michael Mann came along with Heat, that changed it. John Wick comes along, that changed it. You've got to do it the John Wick way until somebody comes up with something as good or better. And they, they will. This, I mean, like again, where it's like fashion, it changes, it rolls, people's eye changes, they want performance. But one thing that'll never change is like, look, it's performance. with the cameraman chad do you get the, your cameraman to come into the rehearsal process and film I, it as you're rehearsing it you spent 15 weeks worth of paychecks like look just to, to prep 
10 guys with a cast that are still, you're looking at anywhere from 300 to half a million dollars to prep, pre-prep. And you still got to rehearse as you go. You get your guys, that's, that's a lot of money in prep. Um, I spend almost triple that for all the, and my budgets aren't that huge. I just know that I want to control where I spend the money. When I rehearse, again, I don't need 20 stunt guys to choreograph. I need my five best guys to choreograph concept. What I need is my five best training guys to get the cast member to do the moves I'm going to do. If I'm not training the cast member to do where I'm choreograph, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. My little stunt choreography team is not going to be on the poster. They're not doing the fights. They may be in the fights, but if I'm, you know what I'm saying? Without training Keanu Reeves to do the I, I'm spinning my wheels. Like I need that guy to do it. That's where all the, the money's got to go in a cast. So now, do you still get pushback from the studio? Oh, all the time. All the time. They just now, after, you know, the WIC franchise doing the Very well. you know, financial suggestion. Oh, yeah. Incredibly people, well. But I still have to explain it. It's like, okay, so let me get this right. We've just spent millions of dollars getting Keanu Reeves and the stunt team and the script to this place. Okay, great. Great. We've rehearsed the stunt guys. There's two other cast members. We're, we're in the millions now of prep. And now, even though we got two decent camera guys, you want them to come in the day of the fight and nail it. And then you want the director, who's never been in any of the rehearsals, to call out the angles and just me nod if they're okay. Yeah. Okay, great. And then you want a guy that's never edited a fight scene to put this together in his special way so he has authorship. And you think that's going to work. You think that's good money. Yeah. When I put it like that, people are going, oh, maybe you're right. Yeah, okay. You bring your camera guys in maybe the, maybe a week before, maybe just to go through the camera box and make sure the gears are. Most of the times you'll bring, the camera guys are seeing the sets really kind of for the first time when you shoot or the day before. My camera guys are coming a month out at least. And if they can't do it, I replace and get guys that can. I use the same two, three camera guys. I love them. These are guys that I do all around guys that are steady cam guys as long uh, as well as the wheels, as long as, as well as handheld. Like they're very successful camera guys. I require, they have to be, I don't care how much my, my camera guys are at the rehearsals. They are actually doing that. We give them a the little video and then I'll bring in the real Alexas and they will practice. If you're shooting all your previews on an iPhone or this little camera and you're doing this stuff and you're not pulling focus and you, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're actually, it's good to show the moves, great. It's good to impress the director and show them how great you guys are, that's awesome. But that's not how it's gonna be. If you are choreographing these multiple guy battle sequences and you're not using something the size or weight of a real Alexa with a focus puller standing by, again, you're not doing a real rehearsal. I'm going to challenge Scott Atkins right now. Give me five moves out of the matrix. Five moves in sequence of any sequence of any fights in the exact moves. Five in a row. Movie you've seen a hundred times and you are one of the best fight guys out there. Give me five exact moves in a row. There's something like this. Not something. Give me five exact moves. No, I'm not going to be able to do it. No, I can't remember those specific movements. So now you're telling me you want me to show two camera guys that have never seen a fight scene on the day of and you want them to nail it? Yeah, no, no. You're asking an impossible task. Story of my life, Chad. Story of my life. So like, well, yeah. we all know it. If it's us, why, why doesn't somebody fix it? Yeah. Okay, well, yes, that's... Well, they won't give me the extra money either. Well, yeah. they're giving you the extra money. But, think uh, about it, and I, I look at it like this. I did all the John Wicks in under 55 days. Every single one of them. So you haven't single. increased the amount of shooting days? I did number film. three shorter than I did number two, and number three is a much bigger movie. It is. One day less than number two. Why is that? Because I spend all my time in prep. Because when I'm on set, I know what I'm doing. My team, my crew knows what I'm doing. I spent, yeah, I spent three times as much as prep. But I saved three times as much because I didn't go over. I didn't pay the overtime. I didn't have the extra days. Wow. I mean, go figure. Preparation works. You know? So when you're talking to someone like Halle Berry or Common or some of the actors that come into the WIC franchise, is the, the main thing you're talking to them about first is, look, you're going to have to train for this. And it's going to be uh, six months of your life or whatever. I mean, how long did Halle Berry train for John Wick 3? Um, we had a hiatus, but Halle was every bit of five months plus some change. And again, that's, she was training a little bit more before that. You got to remember, she was, and that, when I say training, that's not like three or four hours. Halle had to do, because she has 
doesn't have a martial art background or had done a lot of fight scenes before. Mm -hmm. So there's the choreography, the physical training just to get her in shape and to, to take the train. Like you just can't start training eight hours a day, you know, like yeah, yeah, it's, it's a half hour this day. And then the next week it's an hour. Then it's an hour so we have to build up without hurting somebody. Yeah. She's got to spend at least minimal three hours a day with the dogs. Even if it's just playing Frisbee with them for the dogs to get to know her and listen to her. Are these so, dogs basically growing up with her? Yeah. We've bought, yeah the five Belgian Malawan that were stationed here in LA. So we brought in the trainers and the dogs and five days a week, Hallie was with these dogs. She'd bring some home, she'd rotate them. She'd be with these dogs. Then it was, you know, uh, four times a week, three hours a day on firearms. And then the rest was all choreography, work in memory and obviously the martial arts skill. And how did you have the idea of want dogs in it? Where did that come from? Brilliant idea, never seen it before. Dogs throwing people with Aikido moves. Yeah, I just love dogs and we had this idea. I don't know, it's always, I have two rescues. Uh, I love my dogs so much and my dogs can do all these things. Um, they're littler dogs, but they're, they're very, they're very clever. And when I wrestle with them, they're like, you know, we bring them to the Jiu Jitsu gym and all that stuff and they start playing around. So we're like, oh, we should do this with dogs. And it's scary the, the um, velocity that they get when they jump. Oh, oh, and they're, they're 75 pounds each. They're, they're the real deal. Uh, the trick is you got you to gotta, you know, train the dog so they know it's playtime and it's not actually trying to hurt somebody. Yeah. And, you know, I talked to a bunch of trainers and the idea wasn't well received because of, you know, well, that wasn't the norm. Finally, I bumped into a guy named Andrew Jackson who had trained all the wolves for Game of Thrones. And I told him that I just wanted to train dogs in martial arts, but to make it fun and to make it, playful um and he's like well the caveat is well you just can't there's a reason your dogs don't do this or you know when you own a dog you don't want your dog being that aggressive with your yeah. children or your friends or with yourself so you're always you know smacking them or disciplining them to the point where like don't do that don't do that no that's bad dog we had to encourage that now the issue with that is once the movie's over what what do you do with the dog you can't let the dogs go back out and find a different owner or something you know they're being trained yeah. a certain way so we kind of had made the deal with like, look, each of the trainers, five trainers, we're going to adopt the dogs afterwards. We're, so we want to make sure the dogs are completely taken care of. If we do train an animal this way, that we're not ruining the chances for the animal to have a home afterwards. Yeah. So two of the dogs are, three of the dogs actually are still in the movie system and they're all happy home. With, uh, two dogs are retired and just live out in a nice ranch. The other three are still within the industry all with the trainers, but it was just a different way to train. It's like the different way you train your camera, different way you train your stunt guys, different way you train your We just train the dogs in a, in a different way to be part of the fun and excitement of it. John Wick 3 is my favorite of all of them. And it's probably that's because there's more martial arts and obviously I'm a martial arts geek. But it seemed like there was more martial arts than gunplay in this one, even though it's still a lot of gunplay, especially at the end. But yeah. that sequence with all the glass, the knife fight, mm -hmm. that's probably my favorite sequence. Um, I had no idea that the glass was fake. It's I mean, did you get the idea for that on another movie or? No, no, no. Uh, this is just, look, I have, obviously I have a glass and apparently reflection fetish if you watch any of the movies. Oh, yes. The I mean, glass halls or mirrors or I love breaking glass. I think ever since I saw that James Bond fight in Moonraker on their little glass factory, I like breaking stuff. Yeah. Um, as a stunt guy, obviously anybody that's done sequences will tell you like the more elements you put into a sequence, knives, props, guns, reloads, breakaways, the more chances you have of uh, failure or problems where you have to keep redoing takes. So, you know, I'm pretty tight with a lot of the VFX guys and a lot of my friends who are like, okay, let's, again, we know the problems. You know, we know the problems on, you know, how did you reset glass? Does it break the right way? Are you going to slip in the glass? So we try to go, okay, where's the magical combination between us, practical effects and VFX? Um, so when we did it, we're like, okay, well, it's easier for the VFX guys if the glass is a little less reflective, if it's a little bit more cloudy and antique like okay. it is here. And so let's do it in an antique place. Yeah, exactly. And then we build the system back out. And like, I love crazy lighting stuff. So we'll put chandeliers in and I'm like, okay. You know, in every movie, we always see the hero, no matter who he is or who she is, picks up a knife, throws it no matter what distance, and it magically sticks into a lethal depth. And we're like... Tiger Chen, know? sorry. Just got to point out yeah. Tiger Chen. One of our, that's... Uh, she, like, th this whole fight scene is a who's who of, you know, Asian sun guys. Beautiful is, sequence here in the one shot. Love it. 
how could you be certain that the glass would look real because you've done it before or you did a test? We always do tests. Like we get real glass, we do a real breakaway. And uh, not all the glass, I would say 30% of the glass throughout the sequence is real. Like we actually smashed. Uh, like there's one of those that Tiger goes through, one of the ones that Keanu goes through is actually real. When Keanu elbows a glass, that's actually real. Um, but we do tests and we match it up. And again, you get, you get the right VFX guys and the right VFX supervisor who understands quality and subtlety. Uh, they do, you know, there's really good guys out there now. You just got I just ask you about this bit here when he sticks a knife in his head. I mean, yeah. is we that just faking the knife and leaving his hand in the right place? Or was there something that he could like know he was in the right spot? Uh, it's funny. We had Keanu rehearse and rehearse, rehearse with a rubber one that was very blunt that wouldn't hurt uh, our man's head. And then, you yeah. know, just discipline. So you see, as it goes up, he reacts. Keanu's got a good stop. Again, we do a lot of rehearsing as it's going to be. So we know Keanu is using a digital knife, so we practice as if he has a digital knife. So he like, how did you get that knife there to line up perfectly with his eye, just from watching it and saying, yeah, that should work? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. we do it with, again, with a safety knife, a super soft rubber Nerf knife. We line it up, and then we give, like, the half knife, and then we just digitally measure out. And yeah. we'll do a couple of things, and we'll do a really onset. We'll do a quick temp, digital temp knife to make sure it's lined up. So, yeah. I oh, think so that'll what you can check with a digital to, to check yeah. that it's lined up. Okay. We do a quick uh, dirty comp and just check it and, and try it out. And why did you do that to Roger at the end? Uh, I find humor <laughs> violence, I guess. I don't know. I said a lot of dance, like I'm a Bob Fosse freak. I love, and it's not about the moves or how he combined tap with ballet into old school and new school. It's his theory why a plie or why tap, what it says to him. Again, I'm not a dancer. I don't understand all the terms, but, but I get that he's trying to create funny. He's trying to create motion. He's trying to create attachment. He's trying to create detachment, isolation. A lot of directors will talk about the lenses and what that says and how you create isolation or closeness or conflict or aggression or so, you know, the different subtleties of acting or emotion. Choreography does the same thing. And you know we have that holy trinity of what the moves are, what, you know, how we shoot it, and then how we cut it for pacing. If you have a plan before you walk into a fight scene, uh, knowing how to rise people up, like you're trying to entertain. So you, suspense, pace, surprise. Uh, I love the term subversive or subversion, where I want to show you, and like in the script, it says knife fight. That's all antique knife fight. That's all it says. Yes. yes, the knife fight is one of my best examples of subversion. Like, look, it all came from this idea. I came up, I have two younger brothers. We grew up, we had snowball fights. It was just whip snowballs as fast as you can at each other. Whoever throws the most, the soonest. I can see it in about, there. About 10% of them hit. The other ones fall apart in the air. Yeah. And we all grew up throwing knives. And like, honestly, on your best day, what you maybe get seven out of 10 and your mom's kicking knives into the tree. How many times did it bounce back and hit you in the head? How many times did it kindly stick and fall down? I'm like, but nobody ever does that in movies. It's like the gun thing we have. Like, guns run out of bullets. I don't know why it took That's us. One of the things that, that made John Wick better than the rest. Do you right. count in all the bullets all the time? All the time. Yeah. I think there's only once in the movies that we were off because I had to cut a, a piece out. So while yeah. on the day we did count in the movie, it looks a little off. Yeah. Challenging to find it. Um, but like, look, guns jammed. The, the, the point is, back in the day, the Hollywood, con let me put it this way. 95% of what everyone knows of fighting gun work or car chases is from movies. Yes. 98% of that 95% is incorrect. It's bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit. Like no one breaks their arm, gets back up and keeps fighting. No one gets hit in the nose, spits blood. It's what Atkins up. does. Like, well, okay, besides Boyka. <laughs> uh, you know, but I'm just saying like, so if you put a little reality back in your fight scenes of like, look, I get, like, we stretch it with John Wick. I know that nobody could survive a week of John. No one gets hit by cars and gets back up and fight. No one can do a three-minute fight scene and not want to vomit their, you know, lunch up. We get that. But that's what's fun about choreography. So that's what I'd, I'd say to the choreographers out there is put some of that back in. Have yeah. the whoosh stuff. Have the gunfight. But, you know, Hollywood didn't want it because they thought it was goofy to watch guys, you know, put a bullet back in a revolver. It makes it more realistic, doesn't it? It makes you believe it more. And then, so John Wick does something completely fantastic that could never happen in real life. But then when you have the reality on top of it, those moments. So that's, that was magic. Mix. I'll do gun fu. I'll do all this Aikido jiu-jitsu stuff. 
but I'm going to do headshots. And that kind of equals it out. If you just saw the Aikido, it'd be like, yeah, it's a little soft. Yeah. And if you saw just headshots, you're like, yeah, it's a little rough. You can find my, them my favorite headshot was when he was tugging on that guy's beard at the same time. But like, it's like with the knife fight, we're like, okay, what well, can we do sir versus here? Well, the first thing out of your mouth is, well, every time we throw a knife, it never sticks in. All right, well, that's going in. Okay, <laughs> like, you know, how did, like, sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. And do you, I'm sure you understand, I don't know anybody out there, I don't know if there's a human alive that can throw a knife fast and hard enough to go through a leather jacket to actually elicit an immediate demise of the bad guy. The chances of hitting a dead center aorta shot or cervical, like C2, C3, to shut the brain stem off is pretty weak. You can get stuck with a knife, yell, ow, pull it back out, and throw it back at the guy. So we thought that would be funny. Like how, you know, so as crazy as this world is, let's ground it a little bit, and then we'll do the perfect shot with a hatchet at the end. Well, has he still got the bulletproof suits on or not? Yes, uh, but it's not knife-proof, apparently. So, (laughs) you know, and that's people ask me why I keep doing John Wicks. It's like, look, I get to work with my crew that is barn on the best. I get to make up or break any rules that I want. Um, I have great casting choices. I have great location choices. I get to do everything I love from Westerns to samurai film to Kung Fu movies. I've read every good and bad review I can from whether it's a fan base thing or a critic thing. Like, I want to know what people think about it. Cause at the end of the day, remember, I'm not trying to create John Wick as just an art thing. I I'm a fanboy. Like I I'm doing it to say thank you to Leone to Kurosawa to all the great, you know, from anything from transporters to, you know, to, you know, Lupa song movie to the Femme Nikita or a taxi or anything he's done. So, you know, what, what the fans say means a lot to me too. And like, you know, they like, if I, if I put in John Wick's cause I love it. And if you guys like sword fights then you're going to love John Wick three, if you like car chase, you, you know, if you like the 70s stuff, you know, bullet, you're going to like John Wick two, if you, you know, so you, you try to listen to what they say. And you know, if they love Conan, if they love blood, if they love the sword fights, then I want to know, I want to know. What you're you're like. listening to what the fans say, but are you ever going to do what you think the fans want? Or are you always going to do what you want? <laughs> See, that's, that's, you know, and you can theorize and philosophize about it all you want until you're actually directing and doing your own thing. It's very easy. And again, it's, it's, you know, after the first movie, you're like, oh my God, well, I pulled that one off. Second one, you can when I got a third one, that's when you, because now you're starting to question ideas. Do I bring back this character? Do I duplicate myself? Do I come up with something new? Mm. And you, you do, you get, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. There's not a day I don't walk on so stage. yourself. Yeah, and I'm not scared shitless. Like, I, I have a plan, and I have to be confident in front of my crew and say this is going to – but in the back of my mind, I, yeah, I'm shitting myself. I'm like, I don't know. Well, I, I just want to say, because I remember before John Wick came out, you'd filmed it, you'd edited it, I think, and we were in South Africa working on the uh, Grimsby movie. Yeah, I saw you down there. You like, yeah, saying, I'm career, I, think I'm, I think it's going to – I think I'm screwed. I may, I may never direct again. Yeah. I'm, well, I can't – did you really believe that? Yeah, oh no, absolutely, wholeheartedly. That's why I took the jazz so I signed out South Africa. I was like, I better get my second <laughs> back. Yeah. But the answer to your question is, like, look, I, I don't look at it like that. I don't look at, like, well, fans of it. I, you can't think like it's two different entities. I'm just going to go, we write a cool story. I, like, if you saw my office, it's nothing but pictures and notebooks and ideas of things I love. I write all these down. I sit with my writing team and we start writing. I, I don't. I don't try to let what expectations are guide me. I'm hopefully thinking the gut instinct I have of, oh, that's cool, let's put that in the movie. You know, I, I just try to love the same things that everyone else out there loves. And if I make a movie based on what I love, that means it's what they love and hopefully, you know, it aligns. You have but to hope that your instincts like, are gonna be popular. Exactly, just yeah. don't go, don't, I don't ever wanna go, well, you know, somebody think, I don't wanna go down that route. If a certain fan base goes, it'd be great to see this person and you're like, that's cool. I think that would be fun too. I'm just not feeling it. So I'm going to go with this for it. And again, they call it the curse of the sequel. It's like, okay, take, take Matrix or John Wick or Bourne or anything. So you get this cool character that you really haven't, you've seen Assassin a thousand times. You just haven't seen it in a John Wick way or a Neo way or a Jason Bourne way. So that's a little different. And the action's a little different. And then it's done with a little bit more ag- attitude or swagger that's a little different. And the choreography, everything's just different enough to make you go, that was cool, I like that, I didn't see that before. But you have seen it before, just not in that way. So now, you've seen John Wick, you've seen Gun Fu, 
you've seen the longer takes, you're like, oh, okay. Yes. And part of that wow was you hadn't seen that. So yeah. by definition in a sequel, you now want that. Seen it. And other people have copied it as well. Yo, oh, so many times. Now, now I'm going into John Wick 4 and everybody out there, you've all seen Gun Fu. You want it back, but what you really want is Gun Fu, not too different, but different. You want it to know it's Gun Fu, but you want something else you haven't seen. Yeah. You know, you just you don't, don't know what it is yet. Yeah. Right. And you want Keanu to be the badass guy, but you want him a little different. And you just don't want another bad guy. You want a bad guy that's doing something a little different. And that's always the, the trick of it is you want to give them what you want in a way they didn't see coming. Yeah. And that's always the trick with sequels or reinventions or remakes. And I think that's a challenge on every department's level from writing to the look, to the vibe, to the feel, to the attitude, to the acting, to the action. And that's where you have to go. So if you're always worried about that, about how do I progress? How do I go forward? Where do I take it? How do I do that? That helps answer the question of what do the fans want? What they want is more of the same, only better and newer. <laughs> and like that sounds wacky, but yeah. that's where my head's always at. Like, okay, how do I do this? How do I get out of the safe zone of just doing what I've already done and do something that even I haven't thought of yet? And don't get me wrong, we're writing for right as we speak. Literally, that's what I'm in the middle of as we're talking. And it's, I'll start going down this route with the writers and be like, ah, that's really cool. And they will be like, is that even going to work? I mean, can you imagine what the studio says when I pass in a script that says, and John Wick rides a horse and fights guys on motorcycles down Brooklyn? Like, that doesn't go over well. You know, yeah. like, like that is either the greatest or the dumbest idea we've ever heard. I'm like, no, trust me, it's going to be great. It's going to be John Wick's suit, horse, it's be true lies, only better. Yeah. And I'm bullshitting out of my I have no idea. I'm hoping it looks good. You just have to believe in it that, that you know, you have a good idea. And if it sounds cool to, and I, I don't have a, I have a, a great team around me that if they think it's dumb, they kind of tell me. They think it's really cool, they kind of tell me. And you just, you know, you can't second guess your gut. Otherwise, it's chasing the tail of the dragon. You're always trying to chase what someone else thinks. And that's the quickest way to lose your true north. You got to go with what you believe and what you feel. That's it. Yeah, stick with that, Chad, because it's done you very well so far. It's yeah, or, spot on, mate. At least for now. Uh, we'll see. Listen, we all can't wait for John Wick 4 and um, whatever you come out with and 8711 in general. It's amazing, mate. You've done an incredible job and uh, you're right at the top of Hollywood Good for you, Chad. No, thanks. Uh, again, pleasure, dude. Anything you need, anytime, you can always call.